This is Malik Hook from the University of Colorado, and the topic for today is cyclophotocoagulation. I'll be speaking about technology as well as patient selection. I'll discuss both transscleral CPC as well as endoscopic CPC. I'll use a case-based teaching approach, and I'll share some pearls for practice. Mr. JC is a 73-year-old phacic Latino male with 25-year history of primary open-angle glaucoma and advanced disease. He has advanced cupping and visual field loss in both eyes. He's failed trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage device in both eyes. The current pressure is 26 in the right eye and 24 in the left eye on maximal tolerated medical therapy, and his goal is in the low teens in both eyes. The question now is, what are the next steps? From a historical perspective, there have been multiple approaches to treating the ciliary processes to decrease aqueous humor formation. Most recently, diode-based lasers have been the mainstay of cyclophotocoagulation, including transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, and more recently, endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. Interestingly, we keep referring to endocyclophotocoagulation as recently, but I would encourage you to think of this as relative to the transcleral approaches. ECP has been around since the early 1990s and has a wealth of data for both safety and efficacy to back up the use of this device in treating glaucoma. What are the indications and case selection pearls for practice when it comes to transcleral cyclophotocoagulation? In my practice, I use it on patients who have failed prior filtration surgery and are expected to fail further conjunctiva-based glaucoma surgery. I also use transcleral cyclophotocoagulation in patients who have poor prognosis for filtration surgery, like those with neovascular or inflammatory glaucoma, post-penetrating keratoplasty, or post-scleral buckling procedures. I also use it in patients with poor vision where the focus of treatment is on comfort care rather than preserving vision. I also use this approach as primary therapy in patients who are poor surgical candidates. The traditional settings are, as you see here on this slide, 1.75 to 2.5 watts, approximately 2 seconds with 24 spots over 360 degrees. We place the edge of the probe at the limbus, which centers the fiber optic at 1.2 millimeters posterior to the limbus using the G probe. The edge of the probe is placed in the center of the previous spot for each subsequent lesion, producing 24 spots over 360 degrees. I also advocate for using the low and slow technique, where the setting is 3 seconds to 4 seconds and 1 watt to 1.5 watts. The low and slow approach, in my opinion, produces effective IOP lowering while minimizing adverse events, chiefly formation of cataract and inflammation. This is the probe, and I'm going to try and point here on this video to a couple of features. This is the bottom of the foot plate that resides on top of the conjunctiva, and this little piece that's sticking out of the foot plate, you can see it here on the side view, is the quartz tip that's about 1.2 millimeters posterior to the edge, which I'm pointing at here, that is placed along the limbus. And then the curvature that you see follows the curvature of the eye itself. This picture is meant to illustrate the positioning of the patient, typically with use of a lid speculum, although you don't see it in this picture. The take-home message from this picture is that we're trying to avoid the 3 and 9 o'clock positions to avoid the long posterior ciliary nerves and vessels. From a preoperative standpoint, we use retrobulbar anesthesia with lidocaine 2% and bupivacaine 0.75%, plus or minus hyaluronidase if it is available to you. An Atkinson or retrovulbar needle is ideal, 23 or 25 gauge, and a length of 1.5 inches. A 5 or 10 millimeter syringe would be appropriate, although the 5 mil syringe is easier to handle. You should have alcohol swabs to swab the skin prior to doing the retrovulbar injection, and gauze available to you so you can place pressure on the eye and massage post retrovulbar injection. This is essentially a non-sterile procedure. I wear gloves, but I don't gown up and I don't wear a mask. Post-operatively, we use prednisolone acetate 1% four times a day, and then the inflammation dictates the dose subsequent to the initial start of four times per day. Sometimes we go a little bit over four times per day, and we also titrate according to the inflammation during the follow-up visits. 
We use atropine 1% BID to QID. We continue all preoperative glaucoma medications except myotics. The reason that we don't use the myotics is for the increased chance of continuous inflammation with exposure to this class of medication. I check IOP at one hour, one day, one week, one month, and three months, and as needed thereafter. And I may retreat at one month if desired if we do not achieve the target IOP. There are multiple studies available for reading, and I'm just going to highlight a few during this talk. One is by Abdul and colleagues. This is based in Nigeria with a very specific question that was asked. Could we use CPC as primary therapy in patients with good vision? The take-home message from the study? Transcleral CPC controlled IOP in almost three quarters of the eyes at 12 months with short-term preservation of vision and minimal complications. This study also highlighted poor follow-up in resource-depleted areas and the fact that CPC might be an ideal treatment where poor follow-up might be likely. Another study by Shaw and colleagues looked at the use of transcleral CPC in eyes with good visual acuity, in this case, 2040 or better. And what they found was significant vision loss, defined as a loss of greater than or equal to two lines of best corrected visual acuity. And this occurred in 33% of the patients. I included this study to highlight the fact that CPC can lead to a decrease in vision, especially in eyes with good visual acuity, and caution should be taken when selecting which procedure to do in specific eyes, depending on their visual acuity and the intended outcome. A more recent approach for transcleral CPC is micropulse laser. The original CPC that we just discussed uses continuous wave beam delivery, as opposed to micropulse, which has a duty cycle of on and off, on when the laser is treating the tissue and a period where the laser is off and the tissue is not being treated. I wanted to highlight some of the parameters used by Nathan Radcliffe, who was kind enough to share some of his slides with me. For micropulse CPC, he titrates his power between 2 watts and 2.5 watts, but keeps the laser time at around 100 seconds. The laser is then titrated using several factors. Iris color with higher power for blue irides. IOP, he uses more power in very high IOP, especially on patients who are on diamox. Disease severity, higher power in those with severe disease. Visual acuity, lower power with 20-20 visual acuity. Repeatability, lower power if the patient is willing and able to have several treatments. The anesthesia is quite similar to that used with traditional transcleral CPC with retrobulbar block. You can use propofol in this case, which can be helpful but not necessary. Plus or minus eyelid speculum, I would recommend it just for control of the procedure itself. And then plus or minus lubricants postoperatively or during the procedure itself. And I'll highlight why a lubricant is very beneficial with one of the videos that will follow. You can also use a Q-tip or a cotton tip swab for globe control. However, this is usually not needed. From a surgical technique standpoint, you can see the shape of the probe here, which is very different with micropulse compared to the G probe for traditional CPC. The notch is the end that abuts the limbus, and you can see the edge that abuts the lid. This can be a little bit confusing compared to the traditional G probe, so I encourage you to investigate this with your local rep or by going to the website of the vendor that sells micropulse. Apply the laser with a coupling agent. This is the lubricant, either goniosol or gel tears, and you'll see in this following video why that's important. As opposed to traditional CPC where the probe remains stable during the treatment, in the case of micropulse, there's a sweeping action that happens from side to side, while of course still avoiding the three and nine o'clock areas. And this motion should be continuous from side to side while the laser is discontinuous or has a duty cycle of on and off. You can titrate according to what I said in the previous slides, approximately 100 seconds with 2 to 2.5 watts of energy, depending on the patient profile. Sampling of patient scenario is served well by micropulse, patients who prefer laser over incisional surgery. Primary surgery for elderly patients, where they might do better with laser compared to filtration procedures. It also might be beneficial to use micropulse in patients who had a choroidal hemorrhage in the fellow eye at time of filtration surgery, patients with failed tube rather than doing a second tube, patients with poor vision or severe blepharitis, patients who are at risk for falling or those with ocular tumors where you're trying to avoid incisional surgery, 
It's also beneficial to use this in patients who don't have great support at home or who might have issues with follow-up as described in one of the previous papers. If the patient has a tube in the other eye that did not lower the pressure, it might be appropriate to use micropulse CPC as the primary therapy in the opposite eye. There aren't very many papers discussing the utility of micropulse CPC. This is one by Radcliffe and colleagues that found 30% IOP reduction at three months with a medication reduction of 3.3 to 2.4. Short-term follow-up, small number of patients, but certainly informing our practice as we move forward and collect more data. Another paper that I think is worth mentioning is a comparison between micropulse and standard or traditional transcleral CPC. What they found in this paper was higher success rate and no hypotony in the case of micropulse, with five cases of hypotony in the transcleral CPC cohort in the study. Postoperatively, prednisolone acetate 1% QID plus or minus subconjunctival dexamethasone, atropine 1% BID, continue all preoperative glaucoma medications except myotics, which is for the same reasons mentioned before, myotics have a tendency to increase inflammation or increase the duration of inflammation, check pressure at one hour, one day, one week, one month, three months, and as needed thereafter, and you may retreat at one month if you do not reach your desired goal pressure. Post-op day one, pressure may experience a modest decrease or remain the same, minimal inflammation may be present, and the eye is typically quiet. Post-op week one or two, prednisolone QID used until one to two weeks and then stopped. This is dictated by the amount of inflammation, and of course, you can continue steroids if the inflammation persists. Frequently continued reduction in pressure is noted with minimal to no inflammation. Post-op month one, the majority of pressure reduction is realized. If minimal to no pressure reduction, consider retreatment at month one or month two. In Dr. Radcliffe's experience, retreatment occurs in about 10% of cases. Some conclusions for CPC. Traditional transcleral CPC is best used with the low and slow technique, in my opinion. Complications are real, but might be safer than incisional surgery in a particular group of patients, as discussed earlier. With micropulse CPC, it might be appropriate for earlier disease, although we don't have enough data to dictate practice patterns in a specific way at this time. And there's also a question of whether micropulse is safer and as effective as the low and slow technique of traditional CPC. We also know that micropulse is still associated with complications and should be used with caution just like all other glaucoma procedures. The question here too is, is there a better way to target the ciliary processes? When we do transcleral CPC or micropulse CPC, the energy is traveling through the conjunctiva, past the sclera, through the ciliary body, and towards the ciliary processes. Targeting the ciliary processes with other approaches might be more ideal. Part two of this lecture will cover endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. I do want to highlight some further reading and resources. You can go to keogt.com. This is also available on the Orbis CyberSite Library. Please visit Sidra Tree Foundation to look at some of the resources that we have available for lower resource areas around the world. I invite you to follow on malik.kahook underscore md for videos and lectures and the YouTube channel where I post most of these lectures, which is linked below.